If no one's done it, we want to officially welcome you to Beloved Detroit. Hey. And I have the honor of serving as your moderator. My name is Monica Lewis Patrick. I serve as the president and CEO of We the People of Detroit. But I have an amazing duty today. Because if you didn't know, this is the power right here. And so I want to start to my far left. I want to introduce, uh, he is a music mogul. He is a creative artist. He is so nice, you got to say his name oh, twice. <laughs> Bryce Bryce Detroit. Bryce. Yes, yes. I tell you, if you don't know this name, y'all better get your phones out and Google. She is one of the greatest legislators in the history of the city of Detroit. She's actually authored more legislation than any other legislator in the history of Detroit. In 2009, Guardian Magazine said she is the most influential municipal leader in the country. I call her my mama, but I'm going to give her to you as the Honorable Reverend Dr. Joanne Watson. Now, this brother right here is another bad, bad brother. He's an artist. He's an educator. He's a dad. Uh, we all know him as Will C., the MC. But he's also an amazing leader in the environmental space. And so we want to give to some and present to others that bad, bad brother himself, Will C. Copeland. And this sister is like my baby. She's my little sister. But I'm telling you, she's an international figure. She's a poet. She's an author. Uh, she's an educator. And she is one of the most prolific voices in terms of merging narrative with water justice. She is the honeycomb herself, Tawana, AKA Honeycomb Petty. Right. And somebody said, you better get you some friends before you need them. Well, I'm so glad that Peter Hammer is my friend. And Peter Hammer is the, he heads up the Damon Keefe Center, uh, and he also is the leadership of the Detroit Equity Action Lab. But he's just that person that you can call anytime you have a question about, is this equitable? Is this just? Y'all, I'm going to give you the hammer, Mr. Peter Hammer. <laughs> So we just want to start off first, I want to take time, and we always in Detroit want to honor our elders, and so I want to make sure that you know before I show you a couple of slides about the work that we've done most recently, is that the water struggle in Detroit has been going on for decades. And we would be remiss if we did not make this room aware that one of the legislative architects of a water affordability plan that is actually being implemented across the nation, uh, Dr. Joanne Watson was part of that, that orchestration. And so I would like for her to just take a minute to sort of orient us into uh, the mindset, the thinking, the self-determination that was demonstrated in authoring that policy. Thank you very much, Monica Lewis Patrick. Thanks to all of you for being here. We love having you in Detroit. Water is the new gold, outselling all other beverages in this country. And as such, it's become a commodity, not just of health, but of wealth. That we need to recognize that. And as a member of Detroit City Council for a decade, I sponsored thousands of laws, uh, including don't talk on your cell phone while driving, and uh, 10,000 summer jobs for youth every summer. Uh, among other things, but the most important uh, ordinance resolution that I sponsored s called for affordable water for people in the city of Detroit. Water is a human right. right. It's not a privilege. It's a human right, and you cannot exist without water. It, it took years to get that passed, and I have to mention the Honorable Marianne Mahaffey, who then was president of the Detroit City Council. Before I was elected, uh, I was sent to her meetings to help organize for affordable water when I was still working for Congressman John Conyers. I was his point person on reparations and racial profiling and other good stuff like that, domestic violence. So when I got elected to city council, uh, of course I hit the ground running with affordable water because I'd already been a part of that organizing effort. And I'm very grateful to the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization and uh, the United Community Housing Coalition, uh, Marilyn Mullane, uh, Ted Phillips, uh, Loray Brown, a consortium of activists, including a, uh, a woman who later became one of the founders of uh, uh, We the People of Detroit, Cecily McClellan, 
who uh, was an activist in the community and very much concerned about water. Uh, we organized and organized and organized and called community meetings to address the need to have water provided for citizens who were having the water turned off in the city of Detroit. And uh, in that process, uh, we began to realize that Detroiters who own the water system, who paid for it through a mun municipal bond, Detroiters were paying retail rates. Detroiters who own the system were paying retail while the suburban customers were paying wholesale rates. We're paying wholesale. So the customers paying wholesale, the citizens who owned it paying retail. Hmm. And having their water shut off at record rates. Uh, we thought record rises in the water rates. In fact, I voted against every single request for a water rate hike. Uh, but eventually, we put it on the table to have this legislation. Uh, we, resolutions and ordinances are both laws. Ordinances are stronger. We, we were able to get a resolution called the Affordable Water Plan passed in 2005. And that resolution was immediately fought by people who said it was against the law to help poor people keep their water on. It was against the law. You can't use uh, money from the organized budget. Rate payers' money cannot be used to help people keep their water on. But guess what happened? Victor Mercado, who was then director of the water department, he forgot himself at one of, our, one of the many public hearings we held, and it let it slip that they had $5 million set aside out of the delinquent fees, late fees paid by Detroiters. So we said, aha, that's how we're going to fund the water affordability plan. So it was funded and Im implemented for a couple of years, and many, many, many families benefited, benefited. And Without warning, tragically, uh, when the new executive uh, entered the office of mayor, it was eventually truncated, halted, without warning, without rationale, and without reason. And at the same time, there was a terrible, tragic, callous, unconstitutional decision being made uh, by some emergency managers appointed by this racist governor in Michigan a decision made to disconnect Flint, Michigan from Detroit's water system, because we were providing water for all the suburban areas and even outlying areas like Flint, because they wanted to make Detroit's water system look less prosperous so they could be a, an author, a regional authority which would help the suburban customers own and help run a water system being paid for by Detroiters. Now that decision to disconnect Flint from Detroit's water system, as you all well know now, it, it was a poisonous, a pathological decision which put the entire city of Flint at risk needlessly. The Flint River was so bad that GM, which had contaminated the Flint River with its manufacturing of automobiles, they stopped even using the water to build the cars because it was rusting the cars before they were, put, before they were sold. So if it was too bad for the, for the cars, how could it be used for human consumption? And then they lied about it and claimed the water was all right. The water is okay. It just, it just looks bad. It's water, it, was, it was not all right. It was never all right. So you need to know that policies that had to do with greed, racism, disrespect for the populations served or should have been served had everything to do with the water crisis in Detroit and the water crisis that happened in Flint, Michigan. They're connected. They're joined at the hip. They're, they're not two separate issues. It's one issue. Right. Because Flint should never have been disconnected from Detroit's water system. It was deliberate. It was disdainful. It was decadent. Yes. It was destructive. Yes. It was outrageous. Yes. And it still is. I thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Yes. So at least we have some context going into this conversation that Detroiters didn't sit on the sideline that we weren't wringing our hands or waiting on someone to rescue us. We were actually building transformative thinking that now is creating a model for the nation and the world. But Peter, I want you to talk a little bit too about, uh, as, we're, as Council Member alluded to, is that there was a greater strategy at play, that there was a deeper sort of sinister uh, orchestrated strategy that was implemented on the city and how that played out racially and economically. Now, these are complicated questions, as you know better than anybody. 
Uh, and you can take a slice in almost any decade, and there's a story to tell about water uh, and its relationship to the region and relationship to the city. Uh, one thing just to note in the history is that the city of Detroit hasn't really won, run its water system. Uh, it was all part of a, a federal uh, a judicial cabal. Uh, uh, for Yeah, and it, and, and it got spun out of that uh, just hours before uh, the declaration of bankruptcy. So there, there's a lot of interesting uh, machinations that are taking place in the whole history. Uh, but at the Key Center, we, we sometimes talk about spatial racism, we sometimes talk about structural racism, sometimes we write about strategic racism. Uh, and the whole sort of, of municipal distress, allegedly, really has to be told through the lens of, of spatial structural racism. Uh, and that then gets mapped on, onto the water system. Uh, but the actual regionalization of the water, and I would say the movement to the Flint River uh, and the going to the KWA pipeline, is something that we call uh, the, the, the strategic racism. There's an element of intent, there's an element of intentionality, uh, there's an element of manipulation of the political and economic and social processes uh, that force these pieces to move, right? Uh, when they declared bankruptcy, uh, there were a group of us that were arguing for a grander bargain, and the grander bargain would have said, uh, let's use bankruptcy to break these municipal contracts at the wholesale level. Uh, let's renegotiate the contracts in ways that would create regional revenue sharing, where actually use the assets as owned by Detroit that has created the wealth of the entire region as a mechanism to be redistributing wealth uh, that would create sustainability within not only the water system, but the entire regional economic system, uh, and that's a Political non-starter. So you can get a you can get a grand bargain to save art, right? Yeah. Uh, you can't get a grander bargain uh, to save people. Um, and again, there's there's so much to be said, but there's so many amazing voices here to, to share. Thank you for that, Peter. And that leads me into a question for Tawana, uh, because as we talk about this uh, regional agenda of privatization and commodification, and how the Detroit Water and Sewage Department actually was. Uh, there was a national narrative around let Detroit go bankrupt. There was a national narrative around crime and the perceptions of crime. There was a national narrative the last one out shut the lights off. Uh, but we know that 23% of the commerce that comes into the country comes in by way of Detroit. We also know that Detroit uniquely sits on international waters which could generate commerce. But what I know and what I believe is that this master narrative that has been shaped around devaluing and decommissioning Detroit has been, to me, one of our biggest fights. Right. Uh, can you talk about that narrative reshaping, rebuilding, and the work that you did very intentionally uh, in 2013, 14, up to current, and how critical it's been for even helping us in the activist world uh, you know, garner the kind of shaping of talking points that's helping people understand what's happening here because it's so complex. <clears throat> Thank you, Monica. And um, you didn't give yourself an intro, but Monica Lewis Patrick is not only her birthday and she's sitting here with us on the panel, but, um, but she's like the heartbeat of the water movement, not just here, but internationally. And so um, I'm just really, really grateful for her humility and compassion and, and weaving together of all all types of spirits to talk about water. Um, yeah, please, 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 please. Yes. Um, so, you know, I talked a little bit about this yesterday if you were um, here for the surveillance panel. And the reason why I wanna bring this up again is because it has to be driven home. The master narrative of Detroit for the literal last half century um, has, created a situation where everyone just kind of threw their hands up and allowed for things to happen to Detroiters. And so for the last 50 years, 45 years or so, if you left the city of Detroit, people had a particular narrative about Detroit. They wanted to know if you ran into the house, if you were shot, if you'd been robbed, if you've been accosted, um, if your water was turned off, they said you just needed to pay your bill. People could understand and could connect with the fact that Flint's water was poisoned, but they couldn't connect with the fact that 100,000 people, at the same time 100,000 people's water was poisoned in Flint, 100,000 people in Detroit didn't have water. Okay. And there, was, there wasn't this, there wasn't a, an empathetic 
uh, mindset when it came to all these people in Detroit that did not have water. Immediately the response was, well, if they just pay their bill, they'll have water. Now, if five people out of 100,000 people water get turned off, you might say, let me talk to them a little bit about budgeting and maybe I can support them in thinking about finances, even though you don't want anyone to be without water. But if you can't bring yourself to question how 100,000 people don't have water beyond paying their bill, then I have to question what you've internalized as a human being. And so because there have been such a long legacy of systemic racism weaved within propaganda, music, media, any type of uh, image that you can think of that portray Detroit, um, people just didn't stand up for us. They did not support us. They did not help us to resist these dominant systems. And it still happens today. And so I always tell people, and I'm, I'm not going to take super long, but I always tell people that when I hear Detroit is coming back, I hear make America great again. That's right. They're interchangeable because I'm asking you, where is it coming back from? Where is it going to? And who is that for? And so if you're not consistently pushing against the narratives, you're not consistently critically thinking about how our information is leveraged against particular demographics, and then th there's a lot of self-work that has to happen. And so I'm a big believer of I statements and thinking about like what are the ways that we can transform ourselves internally so that we do not become tentacles that extend these systems and do this pervasive violence against our neighbors, right? And so what my role has been is um, in co-founding a magazine, Riverwise Magazine, and creating yeah. poetry, um, and, and any opportunity that I have to have a microphone and a stage is to say, hold on now, you're not asking enough questions. And so um, within the water struggle, I have served in that role um, in working with Monica. And in 2013, 14, we held down essentially 30 to 40 media phone calls per day where a lot of times the media wanted us to serve them up a resident. They wanted us to give them somebody they could voyeur and follow around as the poor person that couldn't pay their bill. But we stood in the gap in resisting that narrative and we reshaped that narrative in Detroit to um, offer up uh, that a system has to be struggled against and not individual people. And I always give Tawana uh, credit for the fact that there was a national narrative that black folks would rather pay their cable bills and buy purses than pay their water bills. Now you can't get any unit utility director to say that because of the work that you, uh, Tawana Petty headed up. So thank you so much, Tawana. It's, it's making strides all across the nation. And I want to talk to uh, Bryce. I'm going to start with you, and then I'm going to go to Will, because we're going we're gonna to queue up uh, Will's video. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the work that you guys have done very intentionally about uh, intersection, in, in being intersectional with art, culture, and music in the water space. And how uh, at the height of the, the takeover and the water shutoffs, how critical that alternative voice was. Uh, because many young people were not attending council meetings and not coming to convenings in community but they were going to hip hop concerts and they were going to poetry slams and they were in spaces where young people gather. Can you talk about the work and how, how you brought that work to bear in terms of a better understanding, a deeper understanding around water justice? So um, first off, my practice is called entertainment justice. And what it is is it's repurposing the role of the entertainer, acknowledging that in real life, our magic is to influence identity and behavior. So it's asking what ways can we intentionally intersect from a racial justice lens with social justice, environmental justice, and economic justice. So because my approach to, as a record producer, my approach is really from a behavior science standpoint, then began to look critically um, based on the way that the average Detroiter who didn't have their water shut off, or who, regardless to their socioeconomic status, they didn't self-identify as poor or working class. That population of people 
where a lot of the ones in the chorus talking about they should just pay their bill, they should just pay their bill. So it's like, all right, first off, you're fronting, <laughs> period. But second, though, you are wholesale buying, consuming this um, national negative narrative about your own people. So for me, the question is, became, what is the way to use entertainment media from a media-based organizing perspective? But what's the way to use entertainment for real to project the identity of someone who is actually being critical about the issue? Folks weren't even asking questions about their neighbor, about their grandma, about their aunties and shit. It was just like really, it was really like some, you can see how folks' behaviors are really conditioned and how cognitive dissonance causes this absence of critical perspective, even if the shit's happening to you. So, um, so for me, it's like, all right, bet, we need to organize culturally. We need to start producing content that brings this conversation down here and just you, let's emotionally impress upon our people the importance of having a critical awareness about what's happening right now. It wasn't even about at first, yo, go help we the people deliver water. Go help this other organization, which was actually a, a founder of in a way, but it became super problematic. So I don't want to mention the name and shit, but um, <laughs> you know what I mean? But anyway, it wasn't even about join the fight right now. It's about join the conversation, as well as for a lot of folks, it became about, and by a lot of folks, I mean the population of people who were impacted, neg negatively impacted by the water shutoffs, but because of fear and shame, were not even raising their hands saying, I need help. So we began to create content and programs that centered this point of identity. First off, going back to this municipal bond, we own Detroit as the citizens. We are the ones who are putting these elect officials, officials, elected officials in office, so in real life, you are the power. This whole shit, this whole infrastructure is supposed to revolve around you, so let's remind you that in fact, you are the power. You are the one who is having something, you're having a war waged on you. You're not a victim of anything. That's right. So remember your power, and then for the other folks, it's like get past your classes bullshit and acknowledge the fact that there is a real situation happening. And um, I'm gonna put a boom right there because I'm sure it's like a five minute warning or something. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bryce. And exactly what you said was, uh, I think where we've continued to operate from is self-determination, cooperative work, understanding that we have power. Uh, Mama Watson told us all the time, uh, we're not waiting on anybody to come save us. We're gonna save ourselves and we're gonna save ourselves by deputizing ourselves. Right. And some of that work that we have done now in Detroit has become the model nationally and internationally for how this work has to be done. And so, Will, I know you've been a part of some of the connection that's happened at the state level and regionally to use culture, to use art, to use mm -hmm. music, uh, to sort of bridge some of those gaps, especially that racial divide that happens in Michigan. Can you talk about that work and what's my time, baby? Five minutes, okay. You know, in Detroit, five minutes mean 15. <laughs> Go ahead, Ben. I'm gonna just try to talk for uh, one or two minutes and then uh, present this video so that you have a visual of what we're talking about. I love the uh, premise, I love the beginning of what are we building upon? What has been created already that we did not create but that we are inheriting and we are moving forward? And uh, welcome to Detroit. Detroit plays a very critical role in this United States of African consciousness, of advancing self-determination, what some people call uh, black nationalism, which is the struggle for our self-determination of a people so that other external things do not determine our quality of life, do not determine what happens in our community, do not determine if we're sick or healthy, if we're literate or illiterate, but that we determine that through our collective efforts. And so we have inherited, I feel kind of like uh, Peter Parker in the Avengers. Uh, when the Avengers gather, I'm like uh, 
swinging on my web. Um, but we have inherited, this is part of the role that Detroit plays within the black African descendant community and within the nation. And so for that, this entertainment justice is just an evolution, it's just us stepping into what Detroit has historically done for the country and for black people. And with that, the flip side of that is there's been a growing awareness and a growing analysis, um, especially uh, coming out of the Snyder administration. It's funny, many people were really freaking out about this Donald Trump thing and uh, the election of Donald Trump as president. But when you do the analysis and when you listen to what their fears are, many of the things that people feared Donald Trump would do were things that were happening in Detroit, to Detroit, and to Detroiters. And so we have, even though people started using the word fascism very recently, we have been advancing the analysis of Michigan as a fascist state and Michigan as an apartheid state for a great part of this decade, well before the Donald Trump election. And so I say all that to say that we are reclaiming our culture. Many people think of black culture and they think of corporate products. They think of uh, global spokespeople, I won't name any names, who uh, have million dollar deals and are paid to endorse million dollar brands. And we are reclaiming our culture just as the activists are reclaiming it from the privatization of multinational corporations. We are reclaiming our entertainment and our culture from these multinational corporations, which as Bryce is saying, are very effective in influencing people's thoughts and influencing people's minds. And so we're just developing a cadre, developing multiple cadres, multiple collectives, multiple crews of artists who are in the movements, adjacent to the movements, next to the movements, with the movements and making things that are gonna be useful for people to realize their dignity and self-determination. And this video, we hope, is one example. We take progress for granted, yet we've come farther and faster in the past century than in the previous 20 centuries put together. And it is no coincidence that this last 100 years takes in the whole history of the oil business. I am from the Great Lakes state of Michigan, a land where you would think everybody would have access to water, but alas, we do not. Our water here is being poisoned by companies, it's being stolen by Nestle's, and threatened by Line 5 and Enbridge. Mindy Machoni! The tribal G-Bombs are in the water! Water power swallowing water bottles, don't bother with it. Politicians, politics flowing like it's bottomless. Started it and finished it, water needed to swim in it. More valuable than oil, be careful, homie, you spill it. My name's Trina, I'm from the Point area. Hi, my name is Pastor Ezra Tilden. I'm here at First Street Mission Baptist Church. Hi, I'm Emily Sielma. I am from Jackson, Michigan. I'm Barbara Payton from Port Huron, Michigan, and I stand with the people of Sarnia, Ontario. And I stand with all Michiganders protecting the water. And I stand with all of those in Kalamazoo who don't have access to clean water. Hi, my name is Shonda Hamilton. I am from Flint, and I stand with the Detroiters for people that's being shut off with water. Look behind my eyes, who know what's trouble brewing? I took an L at home, I'm trying to get a double U in. My work position, I'm the nigga that's behind the wheel. They cut my water off this morning, I'm trying to tell. My clientele was an exec who buy and sell. The water popping juice you're drinking with your breakfast meal. I was high as hell, so I had to check my ears. Around my way, H2O's a life and death ordeal. Power swallowing water bottles, don't bother with it. Politicians, politics flowing like it's bottomless. Started it and finished it. Water needed to swim in it. More valuable than oil. Be careful, homie, you spilling it. Much love from Detroit. Shout out to those struggling for water rights in Yemen. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and I stand with the water protectors in Louisiana fighting the Bayou Bridge pipeline. We stand in solidarity with the way you people of South America whose water is being poisoned by corporate greed. And I stand with Flint. We got our guns on a river in India. We had to shoot some Indians in South America. We almost got rights on a
lake in America Some town of poor niggers in a state called Michigan We got 30 cities across the Midwest They need money to invest, let's double the interest And shut it down as trouble and distress The media pictures, see what black government gets us The water rates are rise, the stakes are high We eliminate supply, then he tugged his tie Shut down Line 5! Shut down Line 5! Many of us women have walked around all the Great Lakes. At Standing Rock, we would get up at 4.30 in the morning. We'd go to the top of the hill and smoke our pipes. And then even if it was 20 below, we would still walk to the Cannonball River. And we would go there and pray for the water and sing our songs. And as we prayed, it caused a disturbance in the atmosphere. You could see the lines of prayer, the energy going up to the Creator. And it disturbed Doppel so much, and so they flew over us and they dropped poison on us. And so uh, <coughs> Grandma Swooping Eagle is quite sick still from uh, the rat poison. They call it Rosio, laced with pumice. And it got in my throat, got in my esophagus, and my stomach, and my intestines. So, uh, on the 28th of this month of September, they're going to take out part of my colon that's laced with the poison. I want to survive, but I want them to take that colon and give it as proof of what they did to us. Everybody put your hands up. Water power swallowing, water bottles on bottom with it. Politicians, politics flowing like it's bottomless. We started it and finished it. Water needed to swim in it. More valuable than oil. Be careful, homie, you spill it. So as you can see, water has power. We have power. Uh, and what I hope you take away with you is that you will deputize yourselves. As I've seen even here in this space, there's been plastic water bottles. And so even that can become a transformative place where you can begin to do large water stations and make sure that we're not participating in the commodification of water. I would also encourage this room to go to the website of We the People of Detroit. There's a book there. Uh, called Mapping the Water Crisis, the Dismantlement of African-American Neighborhoods in Detroit. That information is critical for helping you understand not only the context of what's happened in Detroit, but how it links to everything that's happening globally around the world. I'm Monica Lewis Patrick. I want to thank all of my panelists. That Bryce, Bryce, Detroit, I got to say it <laughs> twice. My council member, your council member, the Honorable Councilwoman Joanne Watson, will see Copeland and Tawana Honeycomb Petty, and none other than the hammer himself, Peter Hammer. And it's been an honor to be with you today. Have a, re a good rest of the evening.